Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, welcome back and thanks for joining us for episode 3 of Wild Season 4. My name is Rich and with me is my co-host, Emily, and producer Neil. Hey everyone. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. No, Ja'an's entire family disowned her for marrying an Ashen, except for Ja'an. His time on Earth changed him for the better. Oh, um... So sorry, but it's good to hear Ja'an learn racial tolerance. On Earth, of all places, it's not exactly something humans are known for. He did not simply learn tolerance. That is insufficient. He learned acceptance, empathy. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Volatile. The release date was October 21st, 2021. The in-episode date was March 24th. The writer was Brandon Vietti. The director was Christina Soda. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits include Troy Baker as Brian Markov and the Cobra Cultist. Zara Fuzzle as Ciara Submit and Windfall. Phil Lamar as Jem Jax and Barzoom. Carl Lumley back as Ma'at Maors. Kari Walgren as Jan Maors, Tinuazo, and Imra Arden. And last is Hinden Walsh as Imri Jaans. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode starts with a flashback to Beast Boy leading the Outsiders in a successful mission to take down the Cult of Cobra, only for us to cut back to present day Mars, where Garfield's worrying about his team on Earth and apparently not sleeping very well. Because Garfield's not doing okay. Hashtag Garfield's wrecked. Yep. After the credits, we see Prince Jaem visiting the Moors household, and our heroes share what evidence they've gathered about the Caven's connection to the Zeta Tube's destruction. It's a busy day ahead, but first, we're introduced to Bioship's daughter, Baby Bioship, who I love with my whole heart. Uh, she's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Later, Superboy and Garfield fly baby Bioship over to the Grand Hall to investigate the site of King Saturn's murder, where Connor's able to find evidence of something that's familiar but that he can't quite identify. In thanks for their help, Jem offers to help Superboy build his wedding altar. Meanwhile, the bridal party is heading out to build the wedding canopy, and we learn that Bioship is retiring and intends to live out her final years on Mars and let baby take McGann back to Earth instead. And I shed some tears. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Meanwhile, the boys pick up their buddy Ba'ar's Oum, the former Green Beetle from Season 2, and head out to build the wedding altar. During the canopy building, McGann speaks with Ciara and learns that she became a sorcerer priestess after her engagement to Prince Jim fell apart due to them being in different Martian casts. At the altar building, Garfield starts having lava-induced hallucinations of Brion trying to kill Superboy and, in his frenzy, runs off with Superboy to take him to the surface of Mars to recharge, which is totally fine. And nothing will go wrong. But back in the Crystal Caverns, Emery and McGann get into a fight about, well, everything. Uh, everything from whether marrying someone who isn't a Martian is out of keeping with McGann's supposed Martian faith, to whether Emery is being racist towards Ah Shen, to whether McGann's chosen form means she's ashamed of her species. To everything. It's a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's just a lot. And it results in the wedding canopy shattering into a million tiny crystal pieces. But also some cathartic conversations about Emery's inability to stand up for McGann when they were kids and how Jan finally understands that McGann's humanoid form is her true self. Meanwhile, Garfield carries Connor to the surface only to emerge into that sandstorm that was mentioned back in episode one, which Beast Boy promptly gets lost in after Superboy's air tank is damaged by flying debris because Jeopardy, Jeopardy, Jeopardy. In the midst of the storm, Miss Martian enters Garfield's mind and heals the psychic concussion caused by being attacked during the riot in episode one, but encourages him to seek out mental health treatment to overcome and recover from the rest of his pain. Luckily, the rest of the altar building team is able to track down both Connor and Garfield with the help of Baby and get them back to safety. 
But when our heroes regroup, McGann reveals that she wasn't the one who healed Garfield and discovers that whoever did was also present at the cave-in by the river. Uh, and over the closing credits, we hear a car- <laughs> Yep, I laughed at just the situation. Not that I can't read this. And over the closing credits, we hear a conversation between Superman and Lois about how he and John are planning to travel to Mars via the Javelin. And also that he has to rush home to make sure Johnny didn't kill anybody with his apparently just starting to awaken superpowers. It's fine. Everyone's fine. Uh, <laughs> we'll get, actually, we'll get into that later. <laughs> You have some feeling the aster to share? Let's get we got we got a lot of aster. Yeah, we got some asters. Hey. <laughs> Let's do the thing. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Dude, I have some things. Can I start with a few things? You have you a list. You can start of with a few things, things too, Rich. I got I got quite okay, a few I, things. I, think, I have a lot for this. I, I have <laughs> I have a couple of things. I think some of mine are gonna overlap, but we'll see. First of all, it actually just occurred to me after our conversation last episode about how the Red Martians were Saturnian, Mm -hmm. that the Red Martian king's name is King Saturn. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought that's why you pointed it out last episode. No, I did I? No, I brought up... Am I already losing my mind? No, no, I brought up the Saturn thing. I also did not point it out either. I just assumed that we all It just occurred to me. Oh, it just occurred to me. So I figured I should make that comment. If I'm going to make that comment, since we have a Ba'arza Um uh, coming out here, we should also... uh, also repeat something I'm sure we said way back in season two, which is uh, Barzoom is a Martian that is named after uh, Barsoom, which is the John Carter of Mars old novel series. It's what the native Martians called Mars in the John Carter of Mars series. Okay, from the 40s? When was that series? The 30s? I can't remember. I'm going to have to look it up know. now. Anyway, Mars is called Barsoom. This character is named after that, which I love that that nod to. Um, let's see what else do I got before I look up some nonsense about 1940s. Uh, psychic concussion. I like this. I like this idea. This, this thing. So a concussion. I mean, you're basically just like if you fall and you bruise your arm. A concussion is basically you just bruised your brain, which, by the way, your brain is not ever really happy about. But like this, this is what it sounded like. She was saying, Miss Martian was saying, like in in this scene, you 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 got attacked so hard that you bruised your brain psychically. So I'm, as she said, I'm I'm healing the psychic damage. That kind of makes some sense. I, I imagine she might be healing some physical damage. Like, what is the difference between mental, like a brain's psychic damage versus a brain's physical damage? That could be a whole philosophical conversation, I guess. <laughs> but she healed that. But I like how they specific. She specifically says, look. Man, this is not a quick fix. You you got to go get therapy and figure out this other stuff. Just because I'm I'm not climbing into your brain and healing all the stuff that's happening in your brain, that's not how telepathy works. And and the reason one of the reasons why this jumped out, I made I think I made a comment about this earlier. I'm not sure if it got cut or not, but I've been watching Strange New Worlds, which is the new Star Trek show, and it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. But in that spoiler alert, maybe there's an episode where uh, somebody who has childhood trauma has to find a memory from that time. And is helped by a Vulcan doing a mind meld, but the way they handled it was so beautiful. Like the the Vulcan was cl- was saying very clearly, this is not a shortcut to health, right? You've got to you got to look at the stuff. <laughs> like you got to look at it slowly. And and me going in there and pulling up traumatic memories so that you can look at them because you've hidden them because of trauma, that may not go well. So that could be bad. So I, I I think like compared to the way that telepathy is sometimes was handled in maybe the 50s, the 60s or other places, it's like, hey, I'm just going to go in and, you know, in, in like a D&D term, I'm going to roll some healing <laughs> hit, hit hit dice and uh, just heal all your psychic damage. Good job. All your trauma is gone now. Wonderful. But they handle it a little differently now where she's like, this is your temporary problem, but it's really pointing toward your long term problem. You've got to go get you got to go get checked. You, you need to go get help. And then. One thing that jumped out at me, and it happened again, it's been a while since I've watched this episode, but the reason they find Garfield on the surface is because they see, quote unquote, Garfield as a mile vac running through the tunnels. And they're like, oh, look, he's made it to the surface because like, he's running it through these tunnels to the surface. But we've already seen him on the surface. And so it got me this time just the same way it got me last time, which was like, 
we've already seen him on the surface. What's he doing in these tunnels? And then it is until the very end of the episode where you find out that that was actually Chameleon Boy leading them out to, you know, where they know that Beast Boy is. And I was like, God, that's weird. Young Justice doesn't make that kind of mistake most of the time. (laughs) I literally remember thinking the exact same thing the first time. And of course, they didn't. That's exactly what was supposed to happen. I I actually rewatched it real quick because I knew you were going to talk about it. You could theoretically piece together (laughs) the idea that like, he hallucinates, sees Brion again, and goes potentially back inside the caves. Yeah, there could be some justification. But you can't piece together that he would be near enough to Connor to do anything about it because he ran away and ran away again from Connor multiple times. (laughs) Two other things. One related to that, like this whole representation of, (laughs) first of all, Emily, he wrote lava induced hallucinations. Yep. And I laughed uncomfortably because that's exactly what it is. The dude, this kid is having PTSD from watching his friend lava is a trigger murder a dude. Yeah. He just murdered this guy, right? Like in front of him. In addition to all the other trauma, hashtag Garfield's wrecked, right? He's seeing all this stuff. And then he does what has happened in the past to people who come back from war with PTSD or traumatic postings overseas. Like they're in a space where like, you know, a backfire goes off. Like this stuff is real. It's not just a drama for television. Somebody wakes up in the middle of the night and they really feel like they're back where they were and they go out and they either hurt someone or they hurt themselves, you know, or they do something because they're not able to think straight because they really don't feel like that they're in the right spot. Right. Like they don't, they don't, they, they don't know where they are. And that's exactly what he does. He grabs Connor and his focus is he's got he's got a part inside his body that is trying to to desperately to protect another person from dying as badly as it possibly can so hard that it this part like takes the wheel and starts running Garfield's body in a completely uh, what we look at as an illogical, unhelpful way. But makes sense if you know that he's just he's trying to like not have somebody else die. This poor kid. Yeah. And in doing so, almost got to the point where he caused the death that he was trying to stop. Gosh, it's just it's just so well done and makes so much sense. And watching Garfield like go through these things this season is is so uh so hard. He's just was he's my favorite Titan next to Dick um when I was a kid. Shape change, animal shape changing kid. Yeah, that's my guy, you know. And um to watch him going through all this is it all makes so much sense because of his past. And it's also really hard to watch. And it works really well because you already pre-established the idea that Connor could be hurt. So in that hallucination, <clears throat> the idea that Brion yep. is going to do that, it's just like, oh, OK, that could that could work. It could work right now and yeah, go much further than it ever would before, especially if you're back on Earth. Yeah. And also in this, I mean, I don't know if I got the idea that it made it really clear what's going on in Garfield's head. It's not like, oh, I saw my friend kill a dude. It's I saw my friend kill a dude and it's my fault. Like I failed you. I'm not failing somebody else. I failed you. I'm going to fail Superboy like I failed you, Brian. Yep. And I'm like, oh, there we go. That's what's going on. Uh, that's another layer of what's happening inside of his body is I'm the leader and it all went awful. <laughs> it was like the worst outcome that he could picture happening, which is terrible. Anyway, my, my last thing that I had on a lighter note was Emery's had how many weddings? Two. Did she say two? Mm-hmm. At either of my weddings. Uh, yeah, at either that, yeah. of my weddings. My, so, my yeah. note just says Emery's had two weddings, and I have several questions. Yeah. I'm like, it didn't sound like she'd separated and got together. So I'm like, okay, so she's in like a poly thing where there's multiple weddings and they- There are options here. Maybe. <laughs> there are a lot of <laughs> options. I'm just, and we don't see any of them. So like- <laughs> it's not like they we saw one of their her, you know, partners, you know, her spouses. So she's I mean, she's doing a lot of stuff. Yeah, because the implication that I would have taken away was that she's not married and had two previous weddings. Yeah. That's right. also Yeah. Crashing the mode details from later. I think that's also how I uh, interpreted this. Okay. I think that's how I at the, originally I think that's how I would I think I would have interpreted it obviously. If we were talking about humans, but my first takeaway was, oh, no, those two marriages are valid. Sure. She has two spouses like there's there's three spouses involved in this relationship is what I'm thinking of because of the way that the show is touching on all kinds of things about gender identity and partnership and and all the things. Okay, hard pivot. 
Microvision is very funny as a term for a power. And it just makes you think <laughs> yep. of like old school powers. Yeah. Microvision. I've used my macrovision. I had questions about that too. Did we see him use that in previous seasons? I don't remember that. I don't either. Am I, I remember it's infrared, been a long time. but I don't remember he definitely had infrared vision. Connor vision. <laughs> He didn't get, he didn't have the heat vision because that, or, or flying, because that was stuff he got when he was wearing the shield. Yeah. Enhance. So, yeah, so either he's, zoom and enhance. Either, <laughs> so he's, so he's, it, it, that's really cool because it's also, it's either, it's either picking up that he's training with Superman, he's learning to tap into things that he didn't have before, which is kind of cool, you know, like, or is he developing new powers or is he developing just like, hey, I always had access to this, but I didn't know how to use it until I talked to Clark. You know, there's a couple ways to go with that. But either way, it's really cool. Because I don't I can't remember another time it was used. Um, I can't either. Yeah. Well, I also like that. Like we had the image that Gar looked at with them, you know, having defeated Cobra. And then we go into a flashback. Yeah. And we we can touch on it again. I get it. People want to see the people. We are people, and we know people, that are desperately <laughs> desiring every piece of every minute that we didn't get to see in this show. And um, I think not seeing those pieces is part of what helps make the show what it is, and as great as it is, but then getting to see it in a flashback. Also, the clues that you're in a flashback are, one, we don't, you, typically we don't get a timestamp when it's like a real fla- flashback. Um, two, you have kind of the the moving images rather than full animation. And I know that that was like a big thing that people had, but I'm like, again, but part of this, while there is an econ. Yes. And I get that it's both. I mean, it's a storytelling technique as well as it is the economics of everything that's involved. But yeah, the fact that you're taking the economics of what's involved and doing the most that you can with it, looking to the credits, looking towards like, okay, it's a flashback and we want this scene, but then let's do this. Or it's, we're going to blur when there's a psychic conversation or so. Yeah, I do understand the argument. um, And I know that it's out of a deep desire to just, like I said, see every second animated in beautiful glory before me, but that's not the reality. I, I was feeling like too, there was something about how it almost felt like, yes, it was a flashback, but it almost felt like, it was an idealized memory yeah. of Garfield mm. thinking back on how it went. You know, it was like it was like it was like watching like a a G.I. Joe or Transformers, you know, show from back in the day. You know, it's like you do this and look out behind you. And, you know, like there was some tone to his voice that was different. I would say that 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 is a verbal distinction that i think is really important because when i say flashback i think i'm wrong in the sense that if it is truly a flashback and we are watching what can be considered a reliable narrated canon then i should have a time stamp because you see that where it's like year you know team year one you're right though this is an idealized memory of his time with the outsiders based on the image that he saw right that's what i think that's what it felt like to me i think that's all i've got so I got some stuff. What? I got, who would have guessed? Can't believe it. <laughs> I got a bunch of different weird stuff for this one that I almost forgot how many notes I took on this episode. So starting off with a random little thing that's early in the episode, but I noticed this time around when watching this that Prince Jem refers to McGann's family as the John's family, even though both of McGann's parents no. use Maors as their surname, which makes me wonder two things. If it's like a Martian cultural thing, like it's, is it more common to take your wife's surname in marriage and not your husband's? Or is it a different, more subtle Martian racism thing of referring to their family with the green surname, even though it's not the one most of them use, especially considering the fact that Jaan's family, the John's family, literally disowned her for marrying Matt. Uh, Yeah. Sorry. So I just thought that was interesting that I like caught that this time through and was like, wait a second. (laughs) Well, I mean, even I mean, I didn't catch that. You probably have it in here. But even to speak further to that point, um, when the discussion comes up in Emery about her changing her last name and it's quick, it's just in there. But I caught it on this rewatch. Basically, she just shouts back. Well, I'm a realist. Yeah. Of like, oh, well, then why wouldn't I? And it's just like, well, that's part of this whole conversation we're having. 
as to why you would or wouldn't make that choice. And you're just telling me, well, yeah, it makes sense. Okay, well, that's we got we got more everything to talk surrounding about. that that we see up until this episode. Like one of the other scientists says, "Yes, I actually know who you are," which means that like Emery has been. Had changed her name and then was lying about who her parents were on some level like to try and get through life of not having the stigma surrounding her because gosh mm -hmm. martian society has so many issues <laughs> but yeah no it's an interesting thing and i notice it it's again it's one of those quick things in the world building that is said and brushed past like no one looks at prince jem weird for this except me sitting at home watching the episode going hey that's not their family name. Yeah, I didn't catch that. It's a little thing. And it's like, if we were referring to the larger family, including like Martian Manhunter and all of his relatives, sure, I'd understand. But they're talking about who knows mm -hmm. about this evidence. And it's everyone in this room who Prince Jem refers to as the Johns family. And I'm like, the Johns know. family. No, they're not. They're the <laughs> other ones. So also, sound design-wise, this is just like a little thing, but I think it's very cool that they're able to distinguish between Beast Boy speaking telepathically versus out loud by just adding room tone to the audio. And it's subtle because you like haven't noticed that that is a thing missing from people's dialogue until you hear it. And you're like, oh, that's different and that's cool. And it's just a subtle little interesting thing. I like it. I, I needed that because when he goes into the area where the king was murdered, He's talking out loud, right? But he's not moving his lips because he's that inflatable, yeah, he's using flatulent the, creature. The thing that's part of his costume that lets him speak even when he's animals. Yeah, exactly. And and then he says, uh, it's not used to being out loud here. And I was like, wait, oh, it's his collar. Oh, the echo. There we go. Other things. Uh, this time through, I also, for the first time, really like heard and processed. There is a moment where when talking to Ba'arza Um, Prince Jem says, you heroically helped the Earthlings banish the wreath reach from both Earth and Mars. And I, it said really fast, uh, and I don't remember any previous mentions of the reach being on Mars. And so I think this is a reference to that mission that McGann, Connor, and Gar go on directly post season oh. two, where they travel to Mars. Because if I'm remembering correctly, mm -hmm. that bit at the end of season two is Calder just saying, Connor McGann, Garfield, but Arzaum has called from Mars. He needs our help. And like we fade out on that. And yes. like that's what they go and do. And we get not much information on that from there. And I'm like, is that what that mission was? Uh yeah, that that's a great catch. Yeah, the timeline fits super well. Oh, yeah. Basically, like going back. And you know, if you think from Ba'arz's perspective of being in all of that and then going back and probably very looking at a lot of people or a lot of scenarios of like, wait a minute, hey, hold on, and then immediately calls the team, oh, I have a problem at home. Could you come help? I have a problem at home that I'm pretty sure I started. Could you maybe come help me clean up? <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks. Also, other things. The reason I have so many notes on this episode is because so many things happen. But I just got to say the music and the story and the performances about Bioship retiring absolutely wreck me as someone who has like a very old pet that has been with my family since my childhood. And like, I don't know how you capture that exact feeling with a non-speaking, non-anthropomorphized spaceship that still clearly has a personality but you do, and it's magic, and it made me cry today. I have seen this episode multiple times and still rewatching that scene yeah. and hearing McGann go, oh, as Bioship clearly telepathically tells her, this is what I'm doing. And I'm like, oh, I this hurts. This hurts, but also is very understandable and very good. Uh, and also just me over here broken over the idea that Bioship would feel like she needs to make sure McGann is looked after and taken care of yeah. and passing that responsibility onto baby Bioship. And like the idea of that being part of their relationship, of the idea of like McGann is older than Bioship and Bioship is still like, no, I look after you. And that kills me that that is an idea yeah. that we are able to communicate about. <laughs> this spaceship that can't talk yeah <laughs> oh and for me like this is a this is the culmination of a moment i've been waiting for since season two 
because there's the there's the the episode where the nuclear bomb goes off yeah and superman gets wrecked and they have to pull him out of the ocean and that scene as she's flying away as as uh, mcgann's flying away with bioship she says something like you can do it old girl like we can do this and i when when they said when she said old girl i was like oh are we gonna lose her this season like is this no. gonna be a thing that's gonna happen and then it didn't Gotta go through so and then it didn't yeah and then it didn't in the next season and then this one i was just like oh and it kind of came out of almost out of nowhere you know because there wasn't anything leading up to it it was just suddenly a conversation was being had and then yeah to be able to to uh personalize a ship without any dialogue the one of the big things is how long does a bioship live? Because my question was like, okay, so you're going to imprint yourself, even though it was set aside for your uncle, so that way you're allowed to sneak on and then fly away. Mm. So thanks to the power Jeez. of Ask Greg number two five two seven three, we find out that Bioship was in fact born in twenty ten. So um and this is I think this oh one, so it is very pet like because you know I have two I have two dogs asleep in this room with me, and there's only a very small number that you'll ever outlive. And you you, you know as a responsible pet owner, you take that responsibility on, knowing that that's un- the part un- an unfortunate part of the agreement you're now in with that pet. But the idea that a yeah. you know a bio ship would be considered old girl or would, then would be considered retiring to have baby bio ship show up. In that time span, especially with the longevity of Martians, like it's yeah, it, yeah, it's a lot to take in. It only adds a, it only adds another layer to the whole thing. Yeah, it's pretty rare that you need to put your, but not. I've ran into it several times when I was a vet tech. It is it has been several times that people have had to put their pets in their will. Yep, because of the long length of their bird and or tortoise that was the big one yep i was gonna say tortoise or bird were the two i thought of always make yeah, sure that your pets um, are looked after that's a whole, them that, in your will because if you don't anything can happen make yep. sure that you have a plan <laughs> as a person with law school people in their family put your pets in your will all right emily i have a discussion to have with you okay uh <laughs> there's something about this scene where when emery's like uh not this story again <laughs> And I hear the story and I'm like, yeah, Emery, that's kind of messed up. It's yeah. like, oh, that adorable story of me being a prankster and stealing somebody else's stuff, like psychically jumping the line on a ship that was supposed to go specifically to somebody who's going to Earth to represent Mars. I'm going to hijack that relationship and everybody's going to think it's adorable. <laughs> like I'm like... There is something a little messed up about this. And Emery's like, oh, my God, it doesn't matter what she does or how she's doing things. She just keeps having a good life. And it's frustrating for for her. How do you feel about this scene? I get get that. I definitely get that interpretation because I definitely get that there are layers to this. Uh, And also, clearly, Bioship still took martian manhunter to earth and like i think there's some level of like i don't think mcgann's plan was i'm stealing my uncle's car forever it was i am hiding in my uncle's back seat for a day yeah and it just so happened that he decided like no she's yours she bonded with you (laughs) you keep her kind of thing but i think it's also emery's reaction also speaks to the idea of emery fully not processing what McGann was going through. Cause even like that flashback image that we see of that story is yeah. drawn in a way that is supposed to be cute and charming. And oh look, it's McGann in her early season one form and oh she's bonding with a bio ship. Yay, so cute. But like McGann's mom understands that even though this is a cute touching story about how you got your lifelong companion pet, McGann's mom acknowledges I'm sorry you felt you had to do that. Like her mom has processed that that is a tragic and awful thing you felt you had to do. Even if McGann still tells this story like it is a sweet, fun thing. Her mom is like, ah, right. That time you did something 
very dangerous and possibly illegal because you needed to run away from home to another planet because your life hurt that much. And I think it's just a level of like, Emery has fully internalized this as McGann did a possibly unethical thing and God, nobody gets mad at her for it. But like McGann's mom is seeing the other side of it of like, McGann did a thing because she was desperate. And we joke about it now because it's become a safe thing to joke about. But when it happened, it was probably terrifying for everyone involved. And like, there's layers to that. Yeah. And I don't want to remove, while you were talking, I was thinking, I don't want to remove, Bioship has clearly been established as a fully sapient being. Yes. With decision-making capabilities, an ability to to clearly communicate. So though, like, Neil and I are talking about pets and like the length and lifestyle, li- life lifespan of of pets, you know, 10 to 15 years or whatever it happens to be, no she's she's a sapient being so yeah. it isn't as if like she went in and and like hijacked it wasn't necessarily grand theft auto but it was um went in and bonded and who knows maybe bioship was sensing like oh no i see you <laughs> i see you in the desperate situation that you're in and what you need and i'm here for you you know i think if i'm going to compare it to something else if we're comparing things I feel like McGann's relationship with Bioship is far more in line with like the way Dragon Riders work in the Inheritance Cycle, uh, a book series that Mm -hmm. I loved as a child. Mm -hmm. That is the idea that dragon eggs only hatch for the person they choose. Mm -hmm. Like you can't force a dragon to hatch. A dragon can sense you telepathically and goes, you're my person. And you get picked by a dragon as much as you pick a dragon. And you are both fully sentient, fully sapient creatures that are choosing each other kind of thing. And I feel like that's kind of that childhood touchstone is how I've kind of always interpreted like Bioship and McGann of like, yeah, McGann snuck in and tried to bond with a Bioship and Bioship agreed to that and said, you're my person. I'm picking you. I trust you as much as anything else. It's a it's, you know, the the wand chooses the wizard kind of thing except with something that's that's a fully sapient being i don't know exactly how sapient the wands are supposed to be but you know i i totally get that and i think you're i think you're totally right and maybe and when they got there john's probably you know listening in like he's like wait this oh oh i see what happened no i get the whole story you're best buddies now you know you're besties i'm here i don't need to go back right now yeah you know do your thing that, that 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 brings up a question though about whether or not like what was the original how, plan? Like, was John planning to go back? Yeah, what was the original plan? Like, was he staying? I mean, he was uh, the ship was allowing him to go back and forth. Also, what's interesting is we talked about the javelin last episode covering twenty five thousand light years a day or something, some <laughs> nonsense. But the bio ship takes thirty days to get from Earth to Mars. She's just which a is good still car. incredibly fast. <laughs> She's just a good car. <laughs> Compared to the javelin, javelin. that is a dude. light speed train. I just keep thinking like, okay, it took me like, I, I don't know, a couple of years before we got the story about, who was that? Christopher, when we when we heard about where the where the uh, watchtower came from. I think it was Brandon Vietti. Well, Brandon Vietti wrote the article, but okay. I think that came up while we were interviewing Chris for the comics. And Maybe. he said, he told us, did you, did you know? I think that's what it was. He's like, do you know where that comes from? And it's like, oh, it's. You know, it was an abandoned Green Lantern Corps outpost. And I'm like, I would have liked a clue about that. And he's like, yeah, just look at the floor in any scene on the Watchtower and you'll see a giant Green Lantern symbol. And I'm like, really? I'm waiting for that with the javelin. Like, that was not made at Wayne Industries. No. Where did this thing come <laughs> from? <laughs> Far away. You know? Like, what? Excuse me? So... Some other notes before we move on from Bioship, I do want to say that I think it is adorable that Bioship taught baby Bioship that laser cannons are an essential feature of taking care of your human friends. Because <laughs> isn't that a thing in like season one that like yeah. that's something that Bioship had to be taught, and now Bioship just taught baby Bioship and was like, no, you need to have this built in. Oh yeah, in um, Failsafe, right? She had to like 
they had to like they had to like mount a gun on her. And well, that was mounting the alien her, weapon but... onto and had to like that was that's a separate oh, thing. But yeah, I feel like yeah, there's an yeah. earlier bit thing. of like when they're first starting out with Bioship of Kid Flash or somebody being like, "Does she have laser cannons?" <laughs> and Bioship being like, "No, but I guess I figured that out now." <laughs> kind I of could thing. do that. That's a thing. Like I know that exists now. That's a that's a that may be a false memory, but like that's in my head as a thing mm-hmm. that like happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can't remember because I haven't watched season one in a little bit, but like I feel like that's a thing. So I like the idea that Bioship was like, no, you have you have squishy humans and they need you to protect those <laughs> laser cannons. Uh, and then <laughs> you, you come cannons. with these built in. But other things. Hello. I love this is the Martian wedding preparation episode and I love it. Uh, and I love all the little details and all the cool cultural stuff we're doing. And I love that they're both excited. I love that Connor is excited about his wedding. I said this in our, our scream somethings, but it's very nice to see a story in which a man getting married to a woman is actually very excited for all of the wedding plans. It's very nice. Uh, it doesn't happen nearly as much as it should. But I love, <laughs> I specifically love, and I think it's hilarious that uh, the bridal party just has to cooperate long enough to build a pretty crystal canopy while the boys have to literally brave the fires of a <laughs> lava pit as a species that does not do well in high temperatures. I think that this is hilarious that this is the tradition that I have summed up as you want to marry this girl? Prove your devotion by facing the very fires of hell without passing out. <laughs> um, which Walk through lava, son. Feels yeah. like a very, like, We've done this for hundreds of years yeah. kind of thing that you're like, maybe we chill. <laughs> also, he manages to have a white Martian, a green Martian, and a red Martian as part of this group. And it's yes. not that they're just moving rocks. They're moving actual lava closer to them to then fuse those rocks together to make the altar. <laughs> yep. And as they're doing that, I'm like, wow, Superboy's just sticking his hand. And we've already established his invulnerability is fading. He is picking up magma rocks, boiling hot rocks with his hands. He loves McGann and he's respecting the culture. Uh, (laughs) I had the thought this time where I was like, it sure is a good thing that McGann didn't fall in love with a human, (laughs) with just a full on human. Like a regular human. (laughs) This would have been a much more awkward situation. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that makes me wonder too, like, like, these boys in the Malafaak form, yep. maybe for a reason. Yep. And yeah. then it starts bringing in a thing like, okay, so I get like a turtle is a turtle shell and he's probably more protected when he's a turtle, right? Or like he can fly when he's a bird, you know, so he can fly or whatever. But like if a Malafaak, maybe they're horrifying because they live near the lava and they have better heat resistance oh. to some certain extent. Mm. And cool. that, you know, I don't know. I'm like thinking about all these background stories of what that potentially could be. But does he get those kinds of special power? Like, what special powers can he duplicate? Because we've kind of potentially established his yes. abilities are part magic, too. So, and that scene, I also just want to give point out the tolerance is insufficient. He learned acceptance and empathy line as both very good yeah. and very important in a, an arc that is largely about metaphorical racism. To have a thing that just straight up goes, here's the point. And like could feel heavy handed or whatever, but like I don't mind it. It is said with a sincerity and in a way that doesn't feel preachy. It just feels like two yeah. people having a conversation about this and Connor pointing out like Earth isn't great at that. And he's like, nah, but he still figured it out. And that's what's important. And you're like, yeah, no, more of this, more of acknowledging the complex acknowledging the com- the complexity of the theme that we are exploring in this arc is just good and nice and important. You know, we talk about this. I mean, maybe this is kind of a canary debrief nod, but like there's a lot of like the reason we watch, I, I think that for me, I think there's one good reason to watch fantasy, read comics, watch sci-fi is, you know, these things are, are looked at in a lot of these genres that we read. Sometimes you got to look at a genre and look at how things are done outside of your everyday life to even get a perspective that it's even happening in your day to day life. Right. Like you, you know, and so I could see Jean going to Earth and seeing like, wow, you guys all look the same. 
right? You guys all look pretty much the same, different skin colors and treating each other terribly. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> that doesn't happen on Mars. Oh, wait, it does happen on Mars, right? Like there's, I can see how him going and taking himself out of his regular everyday cultural envelope can give him that perspective, right? And then yeah. I, I, I just want to second, like you saying, like Matt, he didn't, he didn't like yell at Superboy, like you know, tolerance isn't enough, you know, tolerance has only gotten us where we've been, and blah blah. He just is like, no, man, yeah, tolerance just isn't. He learned, he learned these other things like tolerance is one thing, but this is what he learned. And this is the thing that makes him a hero for us, for, for what feels like he was trying to imply like a hero for Martians, not just a hero for, you know, one yeah. color of Martians, you know, that kind of thing. Meanwhile, on the other side of things, we have the, uh, the bridal party building a crystal canopy. Lovely. All of that. I really, on every we rewatch, I am amazed by how good the scene of mcgann and emery just losing it at each other is of just all of these things that have been referenced throughout these past couple of episodes of both of them finally saying everything and just metaphorically blowing everything up and we'll rebuild it later but it's so good and it's really well written and it's really well acted by everybody involved and I want to point out one thing that we've talked about kind of before in other conversations, and I'm putting it here because I know when we did our scream some things, I don't think we really touched on this. And I was like, I was like, I wasn't sure how to say this. So I wrote up a thing to say this. I'm a cis woman. My views on a possible transgender narrative in a superhero show hold a lot less weight and personal experience than a trans person's on the same scene. But what I will say is that I think that the scene with McGann and Jan about McGann's humanoid form being her true form, that Jan can finally see that now, definitely resonates with some transgender experiences that I've heard people talk about, people I know, people I follow, and could hold a lot of cathartic narrative power for folks going through similar experiences, even if it's not a one-to-one -one allegory, because a fantasy thing is never going to be a one-to-one -one allegory on this thing. There are other layers and nuances here. And I think there's a lot of angles and layers to McGann's journey of self-discovery that like so much of what she goes through and represents still resonates really strongly with me, even though I am a solidly cisgender woman. But I think viewing her and especially this particular scene as a trans allegory is extremely valid. And I would also love to hear someone speak on it from a more personal standpoint, because I know that this has been tossed around after this episode came out and it's been tossed around since season one of people asking if this was the intention with McGann. And I think if I'm remembering interviews correctly, like in season one, it was not intentional. And then once they heard people talk about it, I think it definitely crept into how it was thought of. I don't know if anybody has talked about this explicitly in interviews, but I do think that that was definitely an influence by season four of thinking about that and how to talk about this and how to talk about McGann. And I think this scene can be interpreted and feel relevant to a ton of different people going through a ton of different things, whether it's gender or sexuality or identity or even just like the idea of people who like want to pursue a creative path in life and their parents don't get that until they see them do their craft and are like, oh, that's what you've always been supposed to do. This is who you are, is resonant in all of those frameworks. But I definitely see what a lot of people have pointed out about talking about this scene is like, this is literally her mom going, oh, the way that you chose to express yourself is the truest form I have ever seen you in. And it makes sense, even though that is not what you were born looking like. And yeah, just wanted to point that out because I know it's important. I, I agree with everything that you said. And I, I think the scene, like you say, the second what you said about the scene can relate to people, to almost everyone on some level of some kind of just understanding yourself. And even on a base level of like figuring out who you are and presenting who you are, whatever that is, to your family. Right. This is who I am. It's not who you thought I was or who you thought I was going to be. And it could be anything from like, this is not you wanted me to do this job with you, mom and dad at the grocery store, but I actually want to be an architect 
it could go from anything from that simple level of like just seeing and accepting me as who I am to the thing that it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not subtle no, in this. It's clearly mimicking the language of. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Having a character building over four seasons and, and I think having a scene that can relate to a lot of people and across a lot of uh, ways, I guess, is, I don't have the words for it, is, is pretty amazing for a, you know, teenage superhero show, right? Yeah. And then also hopefully giving people perspective on other aspects of, of what you were talking about. You know, we have an interview about shape changing and uh, McGann specifically that people can go listen to, but that, that interview. Uh, so uh, we had a discussion back uh, 2018, five years ago ish with Sophia Soderstrand, uh, who was a guest who came on to our discussion sessions to talk about shape changing and identity uh, and McGann's ability to shape change. I encourage you to go back and listen to that episode uh, for that conversation that we had and how maybe what was being discussed in that episode maybe is different now for that character and see how maybe that evolved. I'd be interested in, in hearing Sophia's views if she's still you know watching through the show, which I imagine she probably is, and kind of hear what how that experience has evolved. It's one of those things where it is a fantasy allegory and a fantasy metaphor, so it's never going to be exactly one-to-one, -one, but I do think no. it is, at least from my perspective as a cisgender person, handled very well for what the metaphor that they're going for is and it's good mm -hmm. and i think it's important and i like it and i like that there is nuance in it and that there are various ways to interpret the scene and i just think that the scene is very well done my final point in my feeling the aster to transition into <laughs> this other thing <laughs> that is just the extremely emily takeaway from this episode is um i'm a parody of myself but uh connor lifting up mcgann mid kiss under the wedding canopy is extremely cute so also a uh, special shout out to the storyboard artist who drew this scene that i went digging through twitter to find again kelly cow or kelly cow or kelly ko uh, i'm not sure how to pronounce her last name but she storyboarded this kiss and said on twitter that storyboarding a kiss scene was on her animation career checklist and that she was very glad that the first one that she got to do was on Young Justice. And I love it. 11 million points for how good and cute this is. Teenage Emily just screams into oblivion about it. Adult Emily also screams into oblivion about it, but also adds that the added nuance that choreographing a decent kiss in animation can be very difficult as <laughs> someone who's watched a lot of animation especially when you're trying not to make every kiss in a series look exactly the same. So just the little details of them smiling mid-kiss and Connor lifting her up just melt my heart, but also make the scene more real. And it's good. More good kiss choreography and animation because <laughs> I am a parody of myself. I just love them. They're getting married. It's real cute. Neil, you got anything else to add? Yep. Speaking of things that are really nice and well done in terms of animation, uh, I think at the tail end of the conversation when they're on Bioship, at one point, Priestess is talking to Emery and she both physically from like body language. And I think we're led, should be led to believe that like psychically she shuts herself off because she kind of like wraps her arms around herself and then the whole background goes blurred. For oh. a split second. So I, I, mm. I noticed it on the rewatch. I like that. Where it's like That's she's good. being directly spoken to and then everything around her goes blurry. And she's like hunched in sitting in her chair of like, no, I do not want to discuss this topic further with you or anyone. Um, so that was my okay. takeaway on the rewatch was like, wow. oh, I think that basically like you could again, you can read the body language enough. But I think there's also that subtle nod to, oh, I'm also shutting myself off psychically uh, from all of you as well. Oh yeah. Also, the the did we see the Legionnaires talk through? Yeah, no, we had to have because I didn't watch the next episode. Also, I love the Legionnaires of like, well, like it wasn't written down in the storybook, so it's probably okay. Maybe we always mess with the timeline this way. Huh? Yeah, I like I like uh? how Phantom Girl and Chameleon Boy both give her the eyebrow. <laughs> Excuse me. She cared, especially from the perspective of like psychically involving. Because uh, I think it's one thing where Chameleon Boy leads them where they're supposed to go. I think it's something entirely different to have that psychological assistance and conversation 
feel like that's a very different set of scenarios. Definitely. And we'll get more into everything they're planning in Crashing the Moat. <laughs> Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we will be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes we review. This time around, one thing that really hit me is that oftentimes you hear the old adage, show, don't tell. And while I think that's super important in some regards, I think it's gone the way of yes and. Like it's just entered our lexicon. We know what it means. And I'm air quoting heavily. But instead of like thinking about the deeper, yes and can also be no but. So the same thing goes here when I realize with this episode that it's not just show instead of tell. It's show and tell. That's the same way I got taught in kindergarten how to present something that I'm very interested in to help someone better understand it. Because in the same way that animation, basically a picture is worth a thousand words. But if you give me the first 10 that are really important, then I know what the next 990 could possibly be, or at least I've had some guide. So one of the things with this episode is that you are both being shown and being told at the same time in a way that basically has the combination of both allows for a more versatile storytelling method where each person can need something different. It's why we all learn different. It's why we all have different tastes. It's why we all have these different ideas, even within the same podcast that we're reviewing the episode, we see things and interpret them differently. Once you can effectively alternate between both of them, that's when you can truly decide the dynamics and flow of the episode, because you can set things up verbally to have them be countered visually in the same way you could set something up visually to have it be confirmed 100% verbally. The idea that it should be just show and not tell. Apparently, I have had my brain rewired when thinking about the Canary debrief for this episode. So that is to say, certainly, be it with your, if you're writing a novel, if you're making a module, if you're doing an animation, if you're doing a web comic, if you're, if you're creating media that someone else will interpret, try and take a moment to figure out, am I showing and telling? And if I'm doing one and not the other, why and why not? Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode of season four, but in Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. I literally wrote out the Halo is a mother box, uh, Beast Boys having a time uh, joke here for episode three. Completely <laughs> forgot I did that. And now it's four months later and I made it unconsciously last episode. <laughs> Other things. What do I got? We got um, <laughs> noticing and laughing to myself about how the second GM says, yes, we have met before about Ciara. McGann immediately has the look of, oh, cool, got it. You you two aren't subtle. <laughs> and like later yes. says it's like No telepathy required. Yeah. Later is like, yeah, no, I didn't read your mind. I've just studied body language. But I'm also like, yeah, no, McGann has just been on a team with a bunch of people in complicated interpersonal relationships for 10 years. Like McGann sees two people interacting as, oh, they dated and moves on. <laughs> like she could just snap judgment, understand. Uh, and I love that. We also have uh, other things that are set up in this episode. We got the microscopic essence of magic is sparkles, which we won't yes. find out until next episode. But that's why that looks familiar, because Connor's seen that when fighting with Zatanna. Or as we joked off mic earlier, that I like to think that they all just messed around with their powers. And that's how Superboy found out what magic looks like on a microscopic level. Just... Hey, Zidana, throw a spell over there. Connor, I'm going to stare at that till I know what it looks like. <laughs> or, yeah, I think, it, I think it'd be even more interesting if, like, they're just having a conversation and he's like, yeah, there's magic over there or whatever. And they're like, wait, what are you talking about? And he's like, what do you mean? You guys don't see sparkles? <laughs> <laughs> like, you don't all see sparkles? Magic. I mean, magic is sparkles. That's the way it is. Sorry. <laughs> and just Connor having to live with that of like, oh, I thought everybody saw. <laughs> I thought everybody saw sparkles. Okay. 
maybe comes a, just becomes me. a running joke for years of people being like, yeah, Connor thought everybody saw magic sparkles every time somebody did magic. I was like, this is my existence. <laughs> or they didn't believe him. This is my truth. Yeah, they thought he was right. I love it. Uh, <laughs> this is all us just making up things for the five-year time skip as we always do. But other things I noticed this time through, we have in that moment where Gar is talking to uh, Saturn Girl when he thinks she's McGann, the first thing that he says, one of the first things he said is, I failed them all and does not clarify who them is. And I feel like within the context, you kind of initially interpret that as like implying that Gar is talking about like failing the rest of the outsiders or failing both Brion and Superboy or failing like everyone on the ship or whatever it is. And Mm -hmm. then you realize later when he has this conversation with Black Canary very late in the series, he's like, oh, when Gar says I failed them all, he means I have failed everyone I ever love who has ever died because Gar has apparently been yep. carrying that for 10 years. Yes, as someone who yes. started his own rewatch, he very, very much has. I mean, those are the, and I mean, again, looking at the, I think looking at this in the moment, uh, I'm repeating stuff from last episode, but the storyline, I think, was a lot to take in in the moment, but like the contextualized version of this is like, it all makes so much sense because he blamed himself for his mother's passing from jump like that he didn't do yeah. more and was still dealing like those are the conversations yeah. as early all the way back as, in season two yeah, those are the conversations yeah. that were being had then yep with uh that conversation i also have the note that i think it's really cool that the way that scene is written watching it for the third fourth fifth time whatever it is through all of Saturn Girl as McGann's dialogue is written and performed by Danica McKellar slightly off from the way McGann actually speaks most of the time. Like I just know as someone mm. who is mm. as someone who really yep. likes Miss Martian and has watched this episode multiple times, yeah, rewatching sure. it's like, huh, that doesn't quite sound like McGann. It sounds like someone trying to sound like McGann, which is good. That's what it's supposed to sound like. Um, And that's cool. But I also noticed this time through, there's the moment where Saturn Girl says, Brion made his own decision, whatever, to the extent that he was making decisions at all. And I think that that's a really Uh interesting line because it's another hint that that's not McGann. Because McGann doesn't know about Brion's advisor having persuasion and mind control powers. No one does, But someone from the future might know that Uh from whenever that information eventually comes out to people so saturn girl is approaching this with a context that no one in present day has and is accidentally letting that slip and it's cool it's very cool because i feel like that went over my head like the first three times through this episode and then this time i was like hey wait a minute (laughs) yeah yep 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 and then there's also there's a little thing too it's pretty subtle it can be looked over, but the when when uh, Gar goes in for the hug, there's just like a, a quick second of Saturn Girl just kind of like, what's oh okay. And you could take it as like, oh, he just he just hugged her so hugged hugged mm. McGann so quickly and she just got it just caught her off guard and then she hugs him. But in retrospect, you're like, Oh no, okay. McGann always that's not what she was hugs. expecting to have happen. <laughs> always returns hugs and is always waiting for the hug, you know? So like this it's pretty subtle. It's it's not a it's not a big yeah shock face but it's enough that i was like i think that was on purpose yeah that's good and also my final crashing the mode thing is this is the first time that we hear the legion i think this is the first time that we actually hear the legion explicitly say we're not supposed to change anything except you know the one big thing that we have not clarified mm-hmm. what that is but is Superboy's is not allowed to die <laughs> which we yep. come back to this whole crazy thing which we will see next episode the not death of Superboy. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's our first setup for why they're here. Because we've been going through several episodes going, it's very cool you're here, but why are you here and why should I be worried? Mm-hmm. With no context mm-hmm. Still at no all context. for us. Still no context. Yeah. And then do we, I don't think they've even mentioned that they're specifically that they're from the future. But they keep implying that they, like, particularly in this one, like, hey, we're not supposed to change anything. Like, they haven't said it, but they're clearly implying that they're from the future. They have all but said they are from the future, with Saturn Girl saying, the history books don't talk about this one way or the other. Mm, Maybe we always changed something. And you're like, oh, 
you have you've back to the future your way here and you're trying <laughs> right. not to have the photograph right. to nothing right um the only thing that i had was just about earlier when we were talking about emery yes and why it popped into my head maybe this time about the fact that she's had multiple marriages and that they could just be all valid and spouses still around is because they just touch on that like a lot of other things to the rest of this season <laughs> coming up with you know with aqualad and uh who's it lagan lagan who's who's got a couple of couple of spouses uh and a baby on the way and and nobody i mean you, you've got so many different if there's seven to seven to nine i don't know how many are in young justice like different major continent cities of atlantis and they're all have adapted to in different ways to being underwater you've got like you got the shark people and fish people and you've got you know the merfolk and you've got people like aqualad who has gills on his neck but you also have people like aquaman who you know who don't who don't have any uh anything any telltale signs except he can just breathe water like I don't, you know like nobody's really caring what you look like and the kind of things that we focus on on the surface just don't aren't the same there I was just going to add that I think the only reason that because I said there was more crash in the mode to this. Um, I think the only reason that I always interpreted that Emery's I didn't have a canopy at either of my weddings line as her being married twice and separated twice is because when she goes to Earth later this season, there is no discussion of a partner coming with her in any way. <laughs> <laughs> she just packs up her stuff Aww. and goes, I'm going to Earth. And everybody's like, Okay, and there is no mention of like, oh yeah, partner is staying behind or any mention of partners in any way that I'm like, Emery's just lived a life and is on her own right now. Um, is I think divorce how- is also a thing on Mars. There yeah, we go. That's how I how I interpreted it. Um, simply because there is no reference to a partner at one or two at any point in the rest of the show. Also, they're really long lived. So, you know, so there's who knows how many, how many cycling through relationships might be a normal thing as well. Who knows? You know, like you grow with someone to a particular point and then you're like, okay, I think we're, I don't know. I who don't knows? Know. Ask Greg. <laughs> Is there an ask? There's probably an ask Greg out there. It's like, please explain all of the possible intricacies of the traditions of martian relationships as they exist in martian mm-hmm. culture no spoilers <laughs> <laughs> i hope that's the response did you have any crash did you have any mode crashing neil no i don't think so not in this one uh there'll be a lot in the next one so i think we'll just <laughs> we'll just wait till then yep there will be much to discuss and analyze and explain next episode where nothing goes wrong Oh, nope. actually, Nothing I, ever goes I actually I had one more thing that I thought of. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just thought of this because I remember I think I said this in the scream something when we got to the episode that this is technically crashing the mode about. But if you've watched the whole series and are listening to Crash in the Mode, you know that McGann and Connor are not going to get married on Mars. Uh, that's not going to happen because bad things happen instead next episode. But when we do eventually get a uh, Connor and McGann wedding at the end of the season, I pointed out and enjoy the fact that uh, part of their wedding setup has like a flower canopy in the background that I like to interpret as Mm -hmm. we got to have something because we don't have a crystal canopy that was built with telepathy Uh, and just kind of hello. Here's our thrown together one day wedding setup. And someone was like flowers string up as many flowers as possible in a vague arch shape. (laughs) Done. I went and checked. It's not a perfect. But you got to pick them with tele. But... You got to pick them with telekinesis. Yes. <laughs> you got to pick them all with telekinesis. That's what you got to do. Or as in the shape of a ma'alafaak. Yep. Yep. One or the other. <laughs> <laughs> in that what one day of wedding setup, McCann and Connor <laughs> right, frantically exactly. running around, being like, "So this is what we got to do." <laughs> Amazing. They're doing their best. They're doing their best. <laughs> all right. I think we can wrap up this episode. Okay. What do you think? Yeah. And with all of that, <laughs> I think we can now Zeta out of the watchtower. 
If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay stay well, everyone. everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 